Hello, hello. My name is Andrea Miller. I am the host of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm delighted to introduce my co-host, Joanna Schroeder, and our amazing uh, producer, Brian Adkins. We have an incredible guest teed up for you today. Her name is Martha McSally. She is a true trailblazer. So stand by just for a moment for her introduction. But just a, a quickie reminder, our intention for doing this show is to really oh, put our, our wall, learn how to put our walls down and learn how just to really be more open to each other. Let's face it, there's a loneliness epidemic happening. And you might say, oh, loneliness epidemic, that's really theoretical, that's out there. Uh, folks, it's in here. It is in, it's in my life and my family. And I can almost guarantee you, it's in your life and your family too, where there's there are greater opportunities for connection and feeling more seen. And like I always say, somebody has to go first. So we're going first to show how it's done to the very best of our ability. Sometimes it's messy, uh, but that's our intention. So uh, stay tuned for an amazing uh, show and uh, let's introduce um, uh, Martha McSally. Oh my gosh, welcome Martha. Colonel Martha McSally is the first female U.S. fighter pilot to fly in combat and to command a fighter squadron. She deployed six times to the Middle East and Afghanistan, earning the Bronze Star and six Air Medals. Martha proudly represented the people of Arizona in the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives and is the author of the riveting book, Dare to Fly. She has run over a dozen marathons, won three national military triathlon championships, competed in two Ironman triathlons, and has summited several of the world's tallest mountains. And what is most impressive to me, that's all super impressive, but adding to that, Martha has made the world a safer and more equitable place for women in the military. Martha, you are the living incarnation of the bionic woman and the face <laughs> of courage. Thank you for Not being on that. our show. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea, Joanna. Oh my god! Great to be here. Okay, so as an active member of the military, you sued the Pentagon, you sued Donald Rumsfeld, and you won. Yeah, I know it's a bit of a long story, but can you summarize what happened? Because when I read that, I was like, "Wait, what?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, thanks, thanks for this conversation today. Yeah, you don't just wake up in the morning. Uh, I was a major at the time. Um, this is a long story about an eight-year battle I had with the Pentagon um, because they were making our service women be treated like property when they were deployed to Saudi Arabia. And yeah, you don't just wake up and be like, what are you going to do today? I'm going to sue the Secretary of Defense. So it was, um, it was a journey of the principles here for your listeners are, um, I have a, a kind of a, a value in my life of don't walk by a problem much to the frustration of some people in my life at times. They're like, please walk by this problem. I mean, I'll blow up my day because I see a straight, I see a straight dog that I need to go help rescue. And uh, like, I just, I can't walk by a problem. And so this was one of me, you know, just transitioning into fighters. I was just trying to do my job, honestly, show I was one of the guys, show that the jet doesn't care if you have ovaries or not. The last thing I wanted to do was raise some issue like, see, we told you women were going to be a problem. But I found out that our, I was deployed to Kuwait. I found out that our, our troops in Saudi Arabia, you know, they couldn't drive. They had to sit in the backseat of the car and they had to uh, wear basically a Muslim black gown and black scarf. Female, the, the, female, the female troops. Female, yeah. female yeah. troops. Uh, oh, I found out over time, uh, always had to be escorted by a man when they went downtown and literally they were told, to lie and claim their fellow service woman as their wife if they were stopped by the religious police. I mean, the whole thing was just kind of crazy. And look, I'm I'm not saying that we shouldn't be sensitive to host nation cultures when we deploy somewhere, but when the cultures are treating half of the population as property, we should not be then imposing that on the people who are over there defending our freedoms and theirs. So that's kind of the you know a, a cliff notes of. The principles behind this and so uh, i had some difficult decisions along the way but another principle is what's the next right thing to do and so when i had opportunities to speak up i struggled with it and so you know i made decisions along the way to try and bring about this change i had thought initially 
I was told that it was a State Department issue, so I thought I had to go up the chain of command of the Secretary of Defense over to the State Department. That ended up not being true. It's a classic case of bureaucratic policy creep where it uh, started somewhere, got more and more ridiculous over time. Everybody defends it to the death and nobody knows where it came from, right? It's the classic bureaucracy. And so over the years, as I tried to bring about this change within the executive branch, they then ordered me over there. They then threatened to court-martial me if I didn't put the burqa on myself. And uh, I had just difficult decisions. You can read about it in my book, the whole story. Difficult decisions to make along the way. As my oath of office, when I raise my right hand, is to the Constitution, not to what I believe to be unconstitutional policies of the people above me. And I was taught, you know, since I entered the Air Force Academy as a cadet, that um, leadership and courage means doing the right thing, even if it comes at a cost. And so I came to many junctures along the way. I looked for ways to find allies. I learned a lot about, you know, effective ways to bring about change because I'm very much a change agent. And when I was younger, I would just go take frontal attacks every time and I, would, I wouldn't pick my battles. Um, so I learned a lot along the way. But in the end, it was like, all right, there's three branches of the government. The first one has failed. They're trying to just run me down. And so the judicial branch, I mean, you, you have to file litigation against the first civilian in your chain of command. So it was McSally versus Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense. Um, I was able to then go to the third branch of government and get a law passed uh, as, a, as a civilian. I went on a one-woman lobbying campaign, wrote legislation, got it attached to the annual defense bill, and got it unanimously passed in the House uh, as a freestanding bill in the, in the Senate as a, an amendment to the defense bill. And it was signed into law and uh, well, overturned I, the policy was, was like an over an eight year ballot. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. And so many times I'm guilty of this, too. So many times you say, well, what can one person do? And what I just think is extraordinary, even the part that you talk about in the story where there was I forget the person's name. Um, I can't remember if they were in the Senate or the uh, in uh, the House. But there was an obstructionist there that you ended up speaking to it, because there was going to be some loophole, a loophole, not to make it like too more detailed. But when I think about just your persistence as a single person that changed a law that is impacting a lot of other people, like that is extraordinary. Thank you. It, it, you know, it took over eight years, let me say, and it was very... There were times that I really felt alone and I and I really felt like the stakes were extremely high for me personally. And it ended up that I changed it. Oftentimes people try to bring about change and maybe, you know, it, they are, it doesn't happen for some reason or the other. Now, I was going to say it was in Saudi Arabia, deployed back a few times. We wrote into the law that every woman had to be given a copy of the law so that they would see. So there's no folklore. Um and I deployed back over there uh, in the early days of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And I showed up in the middle of the night, uh, got off a cargo plane. I wasn't fly, I didn't fly an A-10 over there. I was in like a leadership position for the air operations at that point. And this, you know, staff sergeant's in processing me on the hood of a Jeep with a flashlight. She's like, here's your, you know, uh, give me a copy of your orders. Here's your room key. Oh, and here's a copy of this legislation that says you don't have to wear in a bio when you go off base. She had no idea. Like I had written that law. Like she had no idea. Oh but it my was, god! I mean, it was it was about eight and a half years later, and I just remember sitting there uh, under the stars, going, "It's over." Like I, I, I finally exhaled. Um, yeah. And by the way, Rumsfeld, when I ran for office, like Rumsfeld donated to my campaigns. He was like, "Yeah, you were right." So like it was you know nothing against him personally. It was just the so bureaucracy. Cool. But yeah. don't you think that that leadership? I mean, when I think about somebody who's sincerely driven by courage who is sincerely driven by um conviction like that is just such a compelling story and and that's the hero's journey i mean because it's almost like that's you you were called you answered the call and and you're transformed as a result like i just love that yeah and, and I, I do think there's another principle here that i saw in my life uh that I, hopefully is impactful for your listeners is we all go through really difficult things in our lives, some worse than others. And I think back on my journey before that. And, you know, I'd lost my dad at 12. I had then been abused by my high school track coach as I was looking for a father figure as this, you know, innocent teenager just trying to find my way and deal with the grief. And, you know, went off to the Air Force Academy, just trying to get an education. And I'm a, I'm a change agent. Like I'm a 
a little bit of a rebellious spirit in me. And after dealing with all that, I thought, hey, I could go either way, you know, with my energy. And I thought this will channel me in a positive direction. And, you know, I was in the ninth class with women there. They still were not quite welcoming. I experienced sexual assault in the military. I'm not trying to just make light of all this. But I went through a lot of really awful, difficult things that it took me a a long time to completely unpack and heal from. But had I not been abused by my coach and later assaulted in the military and dealt with all the nonsense of transitioning into fighters, like I wouldn't have had inside me the grit to say, don't put a burqa on us. Like, don't hold me down. Don't hold us down. Don't hold us back. There was something, and it wasn't completely healed in the moment, but I turned my tragedy into fuel to say, like, no. I mean, I've already had enough of, you know, being put in traumatic and awful situations. I'm not saying it's traumatic, but the point is like as a woman, the fact that they were like, this is the way we're going to treat our women and you should be okay with it. There was something inside me that was connected to my pain and my trauma. I was able to, on my journey in life and healing, not just be crushed by these awful things that happened to me, which nearly crushed me, but I use some principles that I now understand better, but I use some principles to be able to continue to flourish even in the moment, like even right after bad things happen that I'd love to get into. But then also also then go, wait a minute, these things happen for me, not to me. And Oh, we um, love that. We love it. Yes. We love I, that. Not, I yeah. didn't make it up. I've heard other people say that. So it wasn't my it wasn't my right. And also the principle, again, I now have better words because I've studied a lot of this stuff as I coach other people for what I was doing that was just kind of divine ancient truth, right? Which is, um, you know, pain is not optional in life, right? It's just not optional. Suffering is a choice from my view. And the suffering is a psychological framing of what we do to ourselves after we've been through something painful. And we repeat this narrative or repeat something. And we, we, we continue to suffer mostly here. Um, as we choose not to heal. So I, I was able to, I went through pain, but I was able to turn that pain into not just something I endured, I survived, um, but all it, it turned into jet fuel for me to, pr- to propel me on my path to say, it was the same thing. I didn't want to be a fighter pilot when I got to the Air Force Academy. I wanted to be a doctor. I was motion sick when I was a kid. But because I had been through what I had been through with my coach, I was like, you're telling me I can't do that just because I'm a girl? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Like, don't you dare say we can do that. And so these tragedies actually propelled me to be a trailblazer for others. I was in the right place at the right time, but I had the right kind of what was inside me based on my trauma, everybody. We've I have all a, been similar, a similar situation. And I, I want to ask you this because I know you're talking a lot about fear and that's a lot of the work you're focusing on. Like I saw your master class and... Um, so where I grew up, there was a culture of sexual assault that I, I don't want to compare it to military at all. But similarly, where this is normal, you're going to be groped, you're going to be fondled, someone's going to try and slip something in your drink. This is what we do. And you can try and keep yourself safe or you can let people do this. And so I grew up with this um, sense of and then I keep doing like jumpy body because it's so embodied of a sense of like, don't walk up behind me don't F with me. I'm strong. I'll push him away. And as I got older, I found myself not just fighting against, but also almost looking for the fight. Like I, and and not always making great decisions. And I would have these dissociative fight back moments. Like a guy was yelling at me in a drive-thru because he thought I was a, I don't know what he thought, yelling, yelling, yelling. And I yelled back and my son who was 14 had to keep me from getting out of the car. He And I was like, this is dissociative. And I felt shame. I was like, objectively, I know as a mom, I'm his mom. He's 14. I also had like my two-year-old in the car. And I was like, I was like screaming at this guy. I was going to get out. He pulled me in. I knew it was wrong, but I was in a way like, who am I if I heal this wound? Because where does my fight go? Like, hasn't that been what kept me safe? Like, 
but it is all based in fear, right? So when you think about what you went through in your life in order to become this person that other people think is fearless, which is what people thought of me too, were you ever afraid you'd lose the fight by healing that, that wound? Yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. And that is a beautiful question. I mean, when I'm coaching, I mean, people now these days, it seems like it's they don't phrase it that way, but there's like, if I graduate from my attachment to these negative experiences and the way I get triggered and all that goes with it, or I go from brute force, uh, you know, uh, accomplishments and I, I get to a place where I'm healed and I'm whole and I'm being versus doing like, am I going to be bored? You know, am I going to like, what does that look like? And it's a legitimate question, but the answer is no, it's just no. When you are able to, and I'm on the journey still, and I'm literally unpacking things now that I didn't even think I needed to unpack. I thought I had already unpacked them. It wasn't until I got- It's probably I, forever. We it's probably forever. are going to do this We're forever. on a journey. Yeah. You peel yeah. back the <laughs> onion, peel it back the onion, peel it back the onion, right? And it's, and you can only, hand. I can't handle what I'm dealing, I couldn't have handled what I'm dealing with now six years ago or whatever, right? So it's just, you get to another level and then you're able to connect more deeply to the divine essence of who you are is my view and not to um certainly these fear-based identities i'm a victim um and or being stuck in a pts loop which is you know essentially your body feels like the saber tooth tiger is coming after you your body feels like you're being sexually assaulted again when you're not but because there was a smell or a sound or a song or somebody who looked like a perpetrator or just something neurologically, you know, I now again, better understand how people do get stuck in this fight or flight when it's like, they're totally safe, but the, 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 the body and the neurology, if you've read the book, the body keeps the score. That's a good one. There's a lot of, a lot of good books out there, but it it's understandable. There's nothing wrong with you. It, it, you're, if you're stuck in that fear loop, but you can break the loop and you can heal. And there are many different modalities these days that are that are quite effective to do that but once you are able to be whole in an area of your life it opens up a whole nother expansiveness of life and peace and love and connection that were not available before to you to me my experience because you were if you're in a fight or flight mode you are not in a growth rest and recovery mode if you're in a flight or flight mode you're in a fear mode, you're not in a love mode. And literally love and fear cannot be in the same space. And so if you can get out of that fear and be into that a, a, a space that's more love, I don't want to be too woo-woo here, but it's it's my, you know, my experience no, is- love is a transformative force. It's, yeah, we, we are all about love as a uh, superpower, right? And, and it just, it feels like that's what the world needs. And the thing to it um, is like, I'm not the person I was 10 years ago. I'm, I'm not the person, I, and that's okay. But you okay. still fought off that person who came after you. We saw this thing that happened. You, this is what got me thinking about hey, it. Hang on, just rewind. I'm, let yeah. let, let okay. uh, Martha yeah. tell that story. Yes, tell us about this situation that happened in the fall with someone who tried to attack you and did attack so, you. So, yeah, I was uh, in Nebraska for a speaking engagement, and I went out for a walk initially, and then uh, I was walking along the river, across the across the river in Iowa in the middle of the morning in a very safe place. And ironically, I had AirPods in very light, wasn't loud. So, I mean, I could still hear some around me and I was listening to the uh, book, The Untethered Soul, ironically, if you've ever heard of that oh, book. But anyway, one. it was a really good book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Michael so Singer. That, that was a space that my spirit, like my, every, my mind, body, spirit was in, in this peaceful moment. And the next thing you know, I'm being jumped by this man from behind. And uh, look, my assault and my abuse in my life up until this point have been the more nor the normal, not the right word, but the more usual, which is someone you know, you know, who who manipulates the relationship, and 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 then you know there there's assault that can happen within the context. So I, like I I had been a victim of crime maybe one other time when I was younger, getting jumped at a gas station, but um, this was I mean this was shocking obviously in the moment like I, I like there's this I don't even know how to ex describe what happened and what I was feeling in the moment but he just bear, came from behind jumped me bear hugged me and he was just fondling grabbing me fondling me all over my body 
And I, you go fight, flight, or freeze. And in my past experiences when I was younger and not healed, most most of us freeze, maybe fight as, as much as we feel like we can, but often there's a freeze in the moment and, uh, or flight for sure, you know, if you can't, if you can get out. Um, I just, there was something inside me that I was like, there, this is not- Not today, FMP. mother effer. <laughs> today. Not today, and mother. it wasn't even a no. thought. It was just, it was my essence. It was just like, it is not effing happening to me today. And so I was able to fight him off. And look, I, I, people are like, oh, well, you're military. I, I was a fighter pilot. I wasn't a Navy SEAL. I don't have any particular, you know, I'm not a Well, you do have two belt. guns. You're right, right, and, right and left arm since he looked. Guns. You, you got, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, we can oh, talk about that. You are but, not um, watching and yeah. only listening. I have more guns <laughs> now than uh, I have I could. Yeah, Martha has guns. So I fought him off and uh, and then was able to then he starts running and i somehow like uh you know in martial arts i shifted the energy from me being afraid to him being afraid and i started in i don't know what i was thinking i started chasing him which was not smart to be clear there's no one else out there i'm now calling 911 i'm like screaming and swearing on the phone i was swearing a lot i mean i threw my water bottle at him like trying to just like i don't know what it was like i was like to stop him i was like you you wouldn't believe what i said but i just I was just like, no, like you do not have the right. You just do not have the right to even do what you did. Never mind what you were trying to do. And I'm just going to stop you was just where my spirit was. And so I chased him down the path. And then he realized like it's a really long path along the Missouri River. So he he then turned like broke left 90 degrees into the deep brush on, under a, a bridge area and i'm following him into the brush i'm like you are not you are not i'm not letting you out of my sight i wasn't trying to catch him i was trying to keep him in my sight while i was calling in you know support and i i realized at a point like i was now over my head of the brush and i lost sight of him and if the police drove by the path they wouldn't see me so i was like all right this is not my smartest move so i disengaged but i kept like speaking into existence like you mother like i just was like you i see you i saw him i'm like you are not getting away with this never on their way you're getting caught screaming at him and they weren't able to catch him in the moment but because of some amazing detective work we now know so i had crossed the bridge from nebraska to iowa uh and he came out of a building in iowa he passed me on the bridge he turned around pulled a stocking cap out of his pocket put it on and he followed me for almost a mile, not directly behind me. He was stalking me kind of in a parallel way until we were further away from the bridge in the park area. And that's when he jumped me. Were they able to apprehend him eventually? They, yeah, they, 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 were, they arrested him like three days later. Is he yeah. in jail? Is he in jail? Uh, he was in jail. Uh, he is out on bond now. And oh, shoot, um, sorry. There's a trial date coming up. Will you have to so, go there for the trial? Will uh, you go for the trial? Trial, I will have to. Yes. No. Yeah. Do you? I feel, mean, it's, I mean, how do you? How do you? How do you feel now? Do you feel safe today? I mean, so, I could see it going either way. Say, like this, you know, this has been. We could spend the whole rest of the time talking about this journey, which probably, you know, what happened in the moment. Obviously, that was a very traumatic event. Um, to, for anybody. I don't care even the way I reacted. I was in like a... <laughs> so I got back to my hotel room and I, that night I was speaking about how to live and lead with a brave heart and at this event. And then the next day I was speaking in Chicago and I just, I had to... Okay, am I... Am, I'm okay. I'm safe right now. These are things I'm teaching people, by the way. I'm teaching people how to overcome the trauma of the things that they've been through in the past. And I was like, well, I know enough about this that I know I'm still in a heightened adrenaline, sympathetic nervous system state, but I also know I'm safe right now and I got to have compassion on myself. So I decided I was going to speak that night anyway. I was like, I'm here to serve people. I'm going to be, you know, in a heightened state, but that's okay. I mean, I was, you know, I deleted all my slides. I was like, this is what happened to me this morning. Let's talk right. about fear. Wow. Let's talk about wow. courage. Let's talk yeah. about dealing with trauma. And I just decided, unlike my past life experiences, I made a commitment 
I am not going to let this trauma get stuck in me. And I am going to use all the tools and all the resources I have around me to make sure that I go through the trauma and am freed from it real time instead of unpacking it, you know, five years later when you get a health diagnosis or your relationships are falling apart. So I, I made a little video in my hotel room to just kind of capturing what happened. And I just decided, you know what, I'm just going to share this right now. Like that was like this crazy, you know, decision. And then I ended up like sharing every single day in my journey. Like, this is what it is day, day two. This is what it is day three. This is what I'm going through right now. This is where I felt the first emotions and this is what they were. And, um, then I actually came home and I was in just a heightened sympathetic state. Wasn't hungry, just typical stress symptoms, understandable. Cause I also had to be on and I was traveling and then I kind of collapsed into a parasympathetic and then I got really sick, which I never get sick, but I, my body mm, just your, was Yeah, like, your body was like enough already. Yeah. Let me rest. So, but I was, I would say from this, from this attack, what was fascinating, and this is some of the journey I've been on since November, since this attack happened, by the time I engaged with him, the emotions related to the attack were mostly down to ones or twos. Like they just, I was processing it okay. The biggest emotion was anger in the moment. Um, but really I was, I was on a good path with nothing getting stuck in me related to the attack. What emerged had nothing to do with the attack. It had to do with emotions that were still stuck in me from mm, past life experiences. And all the, all the trauma you went through yes. right? from when you were younger. Oh my and gosh. And I had thought, I mean, I had been, I've already been on a journey and done a lot of inner work. And I really thought like, yeah, I mean, I'm feel like I'm whole and healed but it's that onion right it's peeling back that onion peel that onion. so it's not like I, I i wasn't touching any of these issues i've gone through you know a uh you know journey of mind body spirit to get to where i was which i thought was a fairly healthy place but you know the next layer this attacker allowed the next layer to open up i like that you earlier you were like it sounds a little woo woo but you also mentioned it is neurobiology and that is andrea and i both we talk a lot about emdr and modalities like that where we can call it woo woo but what it really is is there are some of these woo woo ideas we're tapping into things that we're only just now understanding are biology and i think for somebody if we both consider ourselves the ones that run into the fire instead of away from the fire which is feels very biological. I don't think I ever chose that. Okay. Intellectually, I'm a chicken. When there's an emergency, I'm very brave. But if you start to think about that, I think I thought I can get over any of these things that happened when I was young because I'm so strong because I am that person that does that. And the reality is you can't just choose it because there is something happening in your brain. You did all that work, but part of your brain was still, hey, I'm not done healing from this. And it's not weakness. It's just biology. Yes. And cerebrally, uh, so cerebrally, I, you know, like I understand, you know, all, I mean, it's, I don't have a PhD in it, but just life experience, the PhD in life, you know, life experiences of like, I understand to, you know, to a healthy degree, like, yeah, again, I felt like I was in a healed, healthy place. I'm self-aware of things that, you know, I don't like to use word trigger, but there's things above the iceberg where you, you know, you get, you get irritated, you get upset, you get whatever. It's always like, oh, okay, what's below the iceberg? Like, what is that related to a subconscious pattern or life experiences or something else that's still stuck? Right. And I felt like I was pretty self-aware, but it wasn't until, you know, this latest little journey, I was like, oh man, I still have some more to unpack. Um, and that's okay because I am not my feelings and I am committed to having the courage to heal, be whole, and to show other people the way and have them connect to the divine essence of who they truly are, free from these things that hold us back, free from these negative life experiences, these negative emotions, these you know traumas, these fears, so that they can truly live the way that they desire and deserve and thrive. And so this is a path I'm on and I'm, you know, I'm in the messy middle in some ways, uh, you know, but, but, but we're all, we're always going to be the messy middle. I'm just getting to the next level. I, it's incredible. And I can imagine how surprised people are when they get to know you. They're thinking, you know, X, you know, and almost like a caricature. And then they meet you and they realize that 
you know, it's like, you know, you were talking about martial arts. It's like a jujitsu. But I've got to ask, talking about you're a combat pilot, you you led squadrons. What do you think of movies like Top Gun and Maverick? Did you ever meet Tom Cruise? I mean, I just have to ask. <laughs> I've not met Tom Cruise, and when I wa- when I watched the first Top Gun, you know, when I was younger, for you know, we're always like, oh, that's ridiculous, you know, like when you're, it's like when you're a doctor watching, you know, a medical movie, right? It's like that's stupid, that doesn't, you know, that's not real. Um, but I, you know, as I as I grew into a more mature human being, I realized it was such an inspirational film for so many people. Uh, to join the service, to want to aspire, you know, to become pilots or astronauts or whatever. And so if that film put a dream in people's hearts for whatever it is they wanted to do, then wow, that's a big success, right? So Well, I gotta, yeah, I, I've got to ask for my friend Gia, who is in the Air Force, flies for United. She, uh, when I was prepping for this, I live in Colorado Springs. So, um, you know, the uh, Air Force Academy is in, in my backyard. She wanted me to ask you what you think the aviation community should be doing to attract and appeal to more women. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I go and talk to schools all the time. And I used to when I was in uniform to as young as possible, there'd be times I would go into an elementary school and sometimes it'd be funny. I remember one where the principal was like, we're going to have a fighter pilot here at lunch tomorrow. And a sociologist would have a field day with it. All the little boys are like, yay. And all the little girls are just sitting there. And then the principal said, she'll be here at noon. And, you know, you can see the little wheels turning. The and wheel then the turning, boys are yeah, like, what? And then all of a sudden the little <laughs> girls are like, yay, you know. And so, you know, we've got to inspire in young men and women generally, you know, to dream big and to aspire to be whatever it is they want to be. Don't let anybody put them in a box. Um, you know, for those who don't let anybody put you in a box, right? Be what you came to this planet to become. Dream big, even if it's impossible. That's awesome. I had impossible dreams. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do something just because you're a girl, right? I mean, just don't let them to get, find other people in your life. So I think for, you know, we've got cultural dynamics of what women should and shouldn't do still. We still have a lot of cultural dynamics we have. Uh, then what's available, which, you know, technically, legally, it's available for you to become a pilot or a fighter pilot. And then there's the, is is that your zone of genius? Like, is that your skill set? Which for any person, you got to decide, like, what what's, you know, what, what feels expansive versus contracted? What are you really good at? And then, you know, then you got to want it, right? You've got to desire it. And so, I, I mean, I said I was going to be a fighter pilot and it was against the law. And people laughed at me and I said, I don't care. Like, I just decided, I didn't say I hope I will. I didn't say I might. I said, I am a fighter pilot and it's going to happen. And I just willed it into existence, even though I didn't have anything to do, you know, with them actually changing the law. But I made decisions at every juncture for me to bloom where I was planted, to excel, to keep my options open, to keep a good attitude and not have a chip on my shoulder, right? What's interesting in reading your book and just one adversity um, after another that you faced, what you described as degrading, degrading and hypocritical behavior and that, you know, you persisted and still overcame it is really just incredibly remarkable. Like, where does that come from? Yeah, and I'm more aware of some of those dynamics. I wouldn't even been able to describe in the moment I'm being propelled because of the bad things that happened to me. I'm, I'm reflecting back on that, if that makes sense, right? In the moment, I, I mean, I just think back. I did a lot in my life based on a lot of brute for, force, dogged determination, like, like relentless pursuit of what I desired to do. I was very motivated because people said I couldn't. There was just something that's not necessarily healthy for the long run, right? That you're motivated by somebody saying you can't do things, but it served me in that season. And I think all of us, there's different seasons in life. So this isn't necessarily the lesson to the 21 year old. Okay. Like I did, if you think about, I have a good friend who kind of teaches breath work. I tune into every morning and he's talks about, he's kind of, he's a Zen guy. He's like, there's matter, energy, and consciousness. Right. And, um, there's others out there who talk about this too. I did a lot of trying to move matter with matter. And if you're trying to oh, move yeah, matter or with changing matter, mind with mind, right? right? You're trying to move like yeah. matter with matter is a dense freaking 
uh, pursuit. Like it is, it is, and I did it and I, and I succeeded at it, but oh my gosh, it was a lot of energy expended on my part to move matter with matter. I now understand I did some of this at the time, but I didn't understand it is we can actually more impact our outcomes in life through moving, uh, moving things through energy and consciousness. And what I mean by that is the, just the basic truths like Earl Nightingale talked about back in the day, we become what we think about. And what our thoughts are, which people think they can't control. I was just talking to a teenage family member of mine recently. She's like, I can't control my thoughts. And I was like, you actually can. It's just a muscle that you haven't gone to the gym to try and exercise, but you actually can. You can choose different thoughts. It takes some practice and discipline to choose another thought, to choose another topic, to go for a walk outside, to do some box breathing, to like get out of that monkey brain, you know, pattern. But if you can get yourself to where like your, our thoughts impact our emotions and we get in a loop there and those emotions impact our decisions and our actions and how we show up energetically. Again, I'm not trying to get woo woo, but we show up with an energy. No, we can totally. all think about it's real. walking into a room or somebody's energy or whatever. And then you end up, I mean, I wish I understood this earlier. We end up attracting more into our life, the very, the very energy that we're on, like the wavelength that we are on. And so if we spend time focusing on our shortcomings, our insecurities, um, I'm not enough, I'm, you know, stupid, I'm weak, you're it, it, like literally whatever your spiritual beliefs on, it doesn't matter. And there's like, it's, and so it is, is kind of what, you know, the universe says to you, right? It's like, okay, if you want more of chaos, if you want more failure, if you want more victimhood, if that's what you're putting out, that's what you're going to get. And I'm not saying anyone who's listening, I'm not blaming you for negative things that you've been through. I've been through negative things myself. That's not the point. But as soon as we can come to the awareness that this is all an inside job and that we are actually co-creating our life and that the circumstances that we have is from the inside out, not the outside in. Like when we, when we say like some man is going to make me happy or some job or some money number or some experience, like that's all saying I'm giving my power away to something external to, you know, to make me happy, which means it can also make me miserable or when it goes away or when I when I get the divorce papers or I lose the job or whatever. But the inside out, if we're like, no, I am, I am love. I am, I mean, I have, I mean, I've been teaching this right now. Oh, I can't turn the thing. I have a bunch of I am statements on the wall back there. What we say after the word I am it energetically impacts us. I, mine are, I am courageous. I am integrity. I am generous. I am growing. I am relentless. I am anti-fragile. I am funny. I'm adventurous. I love, I am strong. I am feminine. I am passionate. I am determined. Those are my I ams. And I just actually kind of, you know, reframe that list over the last year. That's my identity. And when you show up every morning, with that identity, then you can have inspired actions and impacts your thoughts and your emotions. And it's a work in progress for me. I mean, I'm going, you know, I go through, I'm in some, you know, tough situations right now. And it's just like, I have to like, go oh, stop the thought pattern. Stop. Like I know practice what you teach McSally, right? Like get yourself recentered back on your identity. And what, what are you putting out there? And oftentimes when we're putting out there, what we don't want, when we're putting out there what we're resisting, what we resist persists, right? Yeah. Well, it's humbling, right? Right. But I, I want to go back since you were you were in Congress and everything. I'm, I'm like, oh, the Congress should uh, hire you to like train them all. Um, but right now, only 15 percent of Americans approve of how Congress is doing. And I realize you were there a while ago. But only 15 percent of Cong Americans approve of how Congress is doing its job. I think we're up against again, like the government's going to shut down like that can keeps getting kicked down the road. As someone who was in Congress, knowing your incredible integrity, I mean, what do you think the problem is and how does it feel to have represented two of the most dysfunctional organizations in America? Well, uh, back to my principle of don't walk by a problem. I, I found myself yelling at the television. And I mean, I joke that I left the military in part because it was so political. I hate politics. But... I was looking at the dysfunction there and looked myself in the mirror and said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I mean, I was serving overseas at the time. I had just retired 
and I was serving as a professor in the German Alps. I was paragliding at lunch. I mean, I was, you know, my life was was uh, nice awesome. at the time. I was going nice to say, music. like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And But I just had this, like, call to duty turning inside me that um, I, I had more to give and more to serve. And so I, it's a crazy story of how I literally quit my job, got on an airplane, came home and said, I'm running for Congress. What do I do? File paperwork somewhere? Like I had no idea what I was doing. And it took a really, really long journey for me, just like everything in my life, matter against matter. Um, I always take the hardest path for some reason, or I have. And I eventually got elected. The first time I thought I was elected, I went to freshman orientation, voted for the speaker, but then they counted more ballots. I had to come home and concede. And then two years later, I won by a whopping 167 votes out of like, I don't know what it was, 220,000 or something crazy after a recount and all that. So yeah, the joke was my new call sign was landslide, you know, when I finally got there. My race wasn't called until like December 17th. So, you know, I, I went to this very dysfunctional place and it's somewhat dysfunctional by design by the founding fathers. That's the, I was talking to some ladies in the park this morning about this. I was like, the founding fathers set it up to be frustrating by nature, that you can't do massive big change with only one small percentage of Americans behind it when you're going to impact all of Americans. And that balance of powers is intended to be frustrating. And we've now I've kind of everything hyped up with fear and anger and you know, media and social media and like how it's just impacting people. But fear and anger gets votes and donations and, you know, ratings on on, on media. So, you know, we're at, I think, a whole another level of dysfunction, but it's also a symptom of what's also happening in the country, not necessarily only the cause, if that makes sense. Like it's reflecting what's actually happening in communities so I just like, I went there saying, hey, I'm in the room, I'm in the arena. After it took me 1,049 days to get there, my first six months, I was using the word frustrating more than any other word. This place is so frustrating. I can't believe how frustrated I am. I was like, wait a minute. I took three years of my life uh, to get here and I am in a, a energy and thought of frustrating, right? What we just talked about. I said, I got to ship this. So I, I would go out and run down the National Mall, go see Abe. Uh, at least, you know, once a week, I would just be my go around the World War II Memorial, go see pre-COVID, you know, kids from all over the world were coming to this beacon of light in America to see our monuments and see our, you know, our, our way of life. And I would then read the Gettysburg Address. I would read the second inaugural play at a time. I would then like look back at the Capitol and I would be intentional, like prayerful about like gratitude. I release this frustration and I replace it with gratitude. I get to be in the people's house. I get to be a voice. I get to be a vote. And yeah, it was challenging. I mean, my freshman term, I was rated by an outside group as the ninth most effective member of Congress just for getting things done. And I'm super proud of that, right? I was very, like, very practical. I had to deal with all the craziness going around me. Like, you know, I had to, you know, I had to deal with it, right? Like, you can't be naive to it. So you have to deal with it. But I would always look for like, okay, we know where people disagree. Does the Venn diagram overlap at all on this topic? At all. And like, can, can we solve, can we incrementally move it into a positive direction? Because we don't, you don't get anything you want in life and relationships and business. You, you don't get everything you want, everything you want. You just don't. And so why do you think you're going to get everything you want in a divided government in a, you know, checks and balances? It's just, it's not realistic. Um, but that but leads me to an example that I would love to get your perspective on. So when I was looking at your Twitter account, I saw that you do own firearms and that this is something that you're proud of. And um, uh, I am, despite being very progressive politically, I also own a firearm. And I think this is an example of where it seems like almost everybody I know, regardless of their politics, the Venn diagram of what we want regarding firearms is almost overlapping. Like, I believe most people I know would like people to be able to own firearms. Most people I know would like there to be some degree of uh, maintenance and, and licensing. And that overlaps so much. And yet, when it comes to policy, it feels like these huge polar opposites. And I don't know who that's serving. And I wonder if you yeah, have any perspective. Who is that serving? 
It's, I, you know, that is one complicated issue where you're right, there is Venn diagram overlap for sure um, that can address some of the root issues while protecting constitutional rights. I could name like 20 others, like healthcare, border security and immigration. Like we talk about, let's get into some contractive. Um, they're, first of all, they're complicated. That That's one thing I would say. Some of these issues are complicated. People want to sound by, why can't you just, you know, and they think it's going to give them an emotional, like it's going to solve the problem um, when often it's not. And the issues are much more complicated than that. And but the job of a legislator, I saw my job is like to craft legislative solutions that actually fix the you know root I issues and can actually get across the finish line. Don't just put out a press relief, int introduce re legislation and pretend you solve the problem. Every bill that I had, I had to look for. I got to get this out of committee. I have to find Democrats and Republicans. I need to find people from diverse, you know, states because you have to have enough people who care about it to vote for it. You have to get it out of committee. You have to get it out of the floor. So, I, I, you know, so that's the way I operated Schoolhouse Rock for those who watch that, you know, how a bill becomes a law. That's our job. The challenge we have, there's a lot of challenges, but one of them in the House anyway is that the vast majority of seats in the House are either safe D or safe R. And so their only political contest is a primary. So if there's an open seat, you got, you know, 15 people running against each other, somebody gets 12% of the vote and they're going to be a congressman for life. And they'd never, if they want to be, and they are always afraid to find any, to, for anyone to have space between them and the far right or the far left. And so that incentivizes behavior that is not necessarily problem solving. Um, the but Senate. Do you used, think it's worse? I mean, be... it feels like it's worse now. Like this idea of being primary that, that you have to be even more strident and extreme to win the primary, right? It's almost like we need the primary to change. So it's not, you know what I mean? So you get more centrist and people well, that here's... are actually there. Yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I would love to get back to emotional topics that are more expansive. But my last <laughs> thing I would say on this <laughs> is that. I talk to people who complain a lot. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I went to the doctor yesterday because my I, I sprained my hand, and he starts talking to me about, you know, he's super, he's funny. He's like, he's a super liberal guy, but we start talking about dysfunction in D.C. And he brings it up, and he's like, "What are we gonna do?" And the vast majority of people are in the middle, and I said, "Do you vote in primaries? Do you donate to people in primaries? Do you volunteer for people in primaries? Do you host fundraisers for people in primaries?" So if you're not Doing, I said it with a smile on my face, but if if you are frustrated and you not you are not engaging in primaries for city council, for your state representative, for your congressman, for your senator, then you know people will focus on the president only. But all these seats, if more people who are looking for better candidates to be on the general election ballot got involved in the primary, you could take a reasonable person in that you know fifteen person primary I just mentioned help them get to a 15% of the vote and win if, if you engaged a little bit. So don't walk by the problem. If you're going to complain about something, be willing to do something more about it to be a part of the solution, not just say, what, what are those guys doing? So you're sick of talking about this and we totally recognize that, but you need to understand where we're coming from, which is we have this wisdom in front of us and we so appreciate, because what you just said I it seems so obvious, but I'd never framed it like that. I do vote in primaries and I do know how important local elections are. But you just said a thing I needed to hear. And I really appreciate that. And I'll spread that gospel because it feels like it can't go anywhere. And and we we don't want to be uh, contractive, but it is expansive to think, no, we aren't we aren't at war with each other. We're not helpless. But don't but don't be a bystander. Right. This isn't about them. This is about us. And if you feel like there's more of uh, us who care about pragmatic problem solving solutions, well, then what are you doing with your time, energy and money? It, it, did, have you volunteered to support a, support a candidate? Have you donated five dollars or five thousand dollars to help somebody reasonable get out of a primary? What more could you possibly do? Have you voted? I mean, so, so few people vote in primaries. So. Yeah. In the spirit of open relationships, our show and even, you know, politically, because there's so much um, disconnection from, you know, people on, on we think we're so far apart when actually there's more um, that that uh, unites us. But I'm wondering if there was a time when you were sure you were right 
in an important relationship, but in fact, you realized that you were wrong and what you did about it? Oh, it happens all the time. Um, <laughs> let me, let me think. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'd have to really think about a specific, uh, situation, but I would say generally the principle is, are you open to grow? Are you open to change? And there's a difference between what you believe and what you know. So we often get stuck on our beliefs and then we're going to wrangle other people verbally and in other ways in our relationships because of what we believe. But what we believe often can change over time because of, if you're willing to grow, right? New information comes your well, way. But that, okay, but that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pushing back here because it's like, I mean, what, what I have found in my life is that that experience, I mean, it just happened to me the other day. There was somebody that made a TikTok, a comment on my t one of my TikTok videos, and I totally disagreed. And then I went back and I watched the video, and I'm like, oh, this person actually has a point. So I wrote to them. I'm like, you know what? I went back and I watched. And so I'm just wondering, you know, when it comes to those That happened stories. a lot when I was in office. You know what I mean? That, I mean, but obviously in my personal life as well. It happened, I would constantly, my chief of staff and I, uh, we, I mean, we would have these like, you know, we would have these discussions and debates. I mean, they were all very respectful about whatever it was. And, um, you know, there were many times where I came back and I was like, you know what? You guys are right. Um, I, ha I had to, there's part of me, I don't know if it's because, you know, I'm Irish or like my, you know, feistiness of, uh, I, I don't know what it is, but he, they, my, my staff would joke that I have a thing called an opposition reflex in me that I'd be like, oh yeah, like right away I'd come up with the loopholes in their argument. I think because I have some attorneys in my uh, g generational DNA too. I'm always like, I found a loophole in your argument. So I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to take a different stance just to, you know, see how you respond to it just because I can. But having the kind of humility to be able to take the time to go like, all right, I've thought about it while I was out running or, you know, when I was in the shower and it kind of came to me like, okay, I've just was being stubborn in this situation. And what they presented is, is absolutely the better path to take. And so let's, you know, let's go that way and don't, uh, you know, don't rub it in my we face that a, I had to change my mind, you know? Yeah. We had a psychologist on who was telling us it's not dysfunctional when you're in that moment, when you're being mm. disagreed with to not be able to see their perspective, it's brain biology. Yeah. And that it will take the time to get yes. out of that reflexive reactive mode. Yes. And then all of a sudden, then it's, this isn't yes. a, this isn't a glitch in our brains. This is exactly. a feature. It's right? intended to protect us because we will resist change because change is uncertain and uncertainty comes with danger. Like that's just a part of that gets equated with the saber tooth tiger. And so anything that's going to be new or changing, we are, whether you're aware of it or not, neuro neurobiology, you're going to go, no, we need to resist this. Your body's going to say, no, 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 we don't want to do anything different. We don't want to, we don't want to try something new. And I mean, I, I want to do, I do want to share like what's happened in 2024 with me on a topic. It wasn't in a relationship because I think it's a good example. I'm living this out real time. Okay. So my word in the year for 2024 was allow. I've gone from, again, a lot of brute force, make things happen. And I've oftentimes had words of the year in the past that were very action oriented, but the season of life I'm in is to be in a place of allowing instead of making everything happen. It's just the, where I am in my growth. And I no longer set goals. So I spend a lot of time doing past year review. I spent time with butcher paper all over my house, uh, crafting identity based I am statements, you know, just like, what are my I ams of the essence of who I am? And then identity based visions for areas of my life, physical health, relationships, finances, work, all that kind of stuff. It's James Clear takes this approach in his book, Atomic Habits. Don't set a goal, set an identity, and then you build the habits that cast votes for the identity. So instead of saying, I'm going to run 5K, say, I'm a runner. And then when you get up in the morning, like, what would a runner do right now? Well, they would put their shoes on and go for a run, and your habits support that. So in the area of physical health, I have this persona, hey, I'm healthy, I'm fit, I do, you know, 100-mile solo treks on the Arizona Trail, I'm hiking rim to rim of the Grand Canyon, I paraglide, you know, I lift weights, I'm fit and healthy. So 
I didn't think I really needed much transformation in this area, but I wrote down as my identity, I'm physically healthy. I take care of this impermanent vessel. That's all I wrote for my identity. Word of the years allow. I, cra- I was crafting some habits, but they were mostly like breath work, cold plunge, sauna, you know, fitness. I then joined this 90 day challenge with some friends in my network called the Lean Life Challenge, led by Whitney Jones, who was Miss Fitness Olympia three times. I started counting everything I was eating. I resisted it big time. When I filled out the intake form, I wrote down more of what I wasn't willing to do than what I was willing to do. I don't like to cook. I, you know, have certain habits I have, and I just seriously was in full on resistance mode. I was paying for this. It's kind of funny. But within a few days, I realized I was undernourished and overtrained. I had not been giving, I've been doing a lot of extreme physical things, but I had not been giving my body the nourishment that it needed. I was doing a lot of things on like sheer willpower. There's this part of the brain, Andrew Huberman, I've uh, uh, pointed out recently called the anterior mid cingulate cortex, which is the part of the brain that grows when you do hard things you don't want to do. That's my biggest effing body part. Okay. Like it's that's, I do everything at willpower. What I discovered is I was, I, I mean, I was in a place, I'm surprised I didn't get a health diagnosis. I, I, I was so undernourished and I was skinny fat, you guys. I mean, I looked lean, but I did a DEXA scan and I was like, Oh my God, like I'm not the badass that I thought I was. And I had to go through- You are the badass you thought you were, but maybe in one no, tiny I mean, area, not but quite. But I mean, this <laughs> narrative of, I, you know, being fit and healthy, which I am, you know, bell curve wise. But what I was doing was I was, I was taking my jet off for missions over and over again without any fuel in the tank. And so it was pull, I was spinning my wheels at the gym, pulling nutrients from my muscle, from my bones, right? Holding on to fat slowing my metabolism down, impacting my energy, impacting my hormone, all this stuff. And I didn't even know I had a problem. So I had to go through a little grief cycle, like, oh my God, I'm, I'm skinny fat and I'm under. So for me, I actually had to train less, eat more, eat more healthy, eat more protein. And in the first six weeks, I had lost 11 pounds of fat mass gained over pound and 1.2 pounds of muscle at the same time, which is really hard to do at the same time, built my strength. As you can see, I mean, those guns are like, you know, newly my energy. I'm, I'm waking up at like four in the morning, four 30 in the morning with energy throughout the day, like ready to go. And I like, I have, I feel like a million bucks and I haven't like felt this way in years from the inside. And it has transformed me. I allowed it. I allowed it. So I'm so, I mean, it's not, people out there listening may want a physical transformation as well, but because I'm so, I'm practicing the things I'm, you know, putting to trying to teach and coach people on about transformation, I'm walking the walk right now in an area of my life I wasn't planning to transform. So I put together a rapid transformation guide. People can download for free if they go to 2024bestyear.com. So 2024bestyear.com. They can download a rapid transformation guide to just get them going. I'm actually going to create a Facebook community. It should be live by the time people hear this. I totally want that uh, guide. I, I, I feel like you and I are so yeah. similar. Yeah, it's called yeah. the U 2.0 Facebook community. So you can join the Facebook community too. Uh, I'll send you guys the link. But yeah, I had no idea I had a problem, but I said allow, right? And I had that vision and the universe was like, okay, she's ready, bring it in. And it has radically changed my life in the last the last several weeks like unbelievable transformation has happened but it didn't but yeah that I, I was open to but i hadn't planned so there's other lessons in there like again i've set a lot of goals in my life i've set a lot of goals and i achieved them by brute force but you have to be open to allow the divine interruptions that might be coming your way it's okay to set visions and i do that based on identity if i'm taking off in a plane i need to know whether i'm going to new york or la to get going but you need to be willing to divert as you see new opportunities or challenges coming your way and not be so stuck in what you would hope to do Um, and be ready for areas of growth that come your way that maybe you had a blind spot you didn't even need need you didn't know you needed to grow in 
Oh my God. Amen to the blind, you know, to starting to see that blind spot. Right. And I love your idea of just of inviting the universe to, to, you know, be for you to be a channel, right. When you allow that, I mean, I can relate to that entirely. It's like, Ooh, let, you know, let me not do brute force anymore. And, uh, and, and be really, really open. It's, uh, it, it's pretty magical. It's, it's great to hear that. Uh, Martha, thank you so much. This has been such a invigorating, inspiring so conversation. Fun. Yeah. Well, we'll love to have you back on the show. I feel like we could talk for many, many more hours. Yes, yeah, so we have so um, many different topics we could, you know, angles we could go down. Totally. Okay. 2024bestyear.com is where people can get that um, that uh, pat or that uh, plan, yeah, the that rapid transformation guide, and there'll be a, uh, there'll be more information on kind of the story, a little video from me about what I've actually been through, and then the guide for how you can apply these principles in your life, whether you want to transform your health, your physicality, your relationships, your finances, whatever it is. It's the principles that I use that can help you in your rapid transformation. Amazing. And then uh, Martha's book is Dare to Fly. It is awesome. It is so riveting and inspiring. So woo, thank you so much, Martha. We look forward to having you Absolutely. back on Open Relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. People can also, like I said, you can join oh, join the Facebook community that I've created, U2.0. Uh, so look for that on Facebook. It's all about transitioning from your identity being attached to all the things you do to actually really becoming the true identity of who you are and being able to flourish in life because of that oh look at that you got the you got the yeah there you go rapid transformation all right amazing thank you oh. all right thank you